This is a course about ideas and arguments relating to justice in, broadly speaking, the Anglo-American analytic tradition in political philosophy. We'll be pushing pretty hard against that tradition, especially later in the course. Still, for the most part, the arguments we'll be encountering begin roughly in the 19th century and are elaborated, criticized, reformulated, and sometimes rejected through the 20th century up to the present day. We'll be using these ideas and arguments to grapple with some pressing real-world issues and controversies in law and policy. We'll see if these theories can help us wrestle with these dilemmas, perhaps provide insight, but we'll also use the real-world examples to look back and think critically about the theories themselves. To begin that exercise, I want to consider a more immediate, local problem for us in this course. How should I distribute grades? Now let's think through that distributional question as a problem of justice. You might think, well, this isn't a problem at all. Give us the grades we earn. But suppose I didn't want to do all of that work. If I simply distribute grades randomly, then the only students likely to complain are those of you who worked hard but got a bad grade. Now in those cases, I'll actually do my job. I'll, I'll read and grade your work. Less work for all of us. Now, of course, I can't imagine you'd let me get away with that. So instead, what if I just give everybody an A+. This isn't simply a perverse philosopher's thought experiment. About a decade ago, a physics professor at the University of Ottawa, Dennis Rancourt, he did just this. He gave all the students in an upper-level course A-pluses. And his reasoning was interesting. He argued that students don't learn especially well when they're being graded, certainly not when they're being lectured at in stuffy halls and seminar rooms. If you want to learn, say, statistical mechanics, read the textbook, do the problem sets, come see me in my office hours and we'll work through the problems together. You'll learn statistical mechanics, but in class, huh, let's talk about something else. Noam Chomsky, Manufacturing Consent. I've always wanted to read that. Let's talk about that. The practice, I believe, was called course squatting, where the course is about one thing, but then you teach something completely different. That last flourish, the doing something completely unrelated in class time, that might seem completely beyond the pale. And indeed, things didn't work out well for Professor Rancourt. Turns out that even with tenure, you still have to do your job. One of his students was especially withering in his criticism. He said, the problem with Rancourt isn't that he didn't grade us. The problem is he didn't teach us anything. That's fair. But what about the concerns over learning? Did Rancourt have a point? As educators, we know that students learn in different ways. And we know that grading pushes you to approach the material in ways that may not be the best approach for deep enduring understanding of the material. Still, we continue to do our courses in ways that provoke this question that we love to hate. Professor, will this be on the exam? Well, if we want to avoid that question, let's just do away with all the contrived rubrics and metrics, the evaluative criteria. Let's scrap it all, and we'll figure out this material together. Suppose Rancourt was onto something. Grading really isn't a great way to teach. What was wrong with what he then did, giving top grades to everyone? Now, I suspect many of you would feel that if I gave everyone A's, that's a breach of contract. I mean, the university pays me to teach. You, the students, pay tuition to the university. You enroll in a course. You expect to learn the material. You trust me to do my job. And if I simply hand out top grades to everyone, I ignore the merits of your hard work, and I should be responsible for that dereliction of duty. Okay, so there are considerations of merit and responsibility here. Still, you could say that Rancourt's grading method had a certain elegance. It's impartial. Same rule applies to everyone. Isn't that equal treatment? What's the problem here? Let's put that question another way. Granted that there are considerations of merit and obligation and responsibility involved in grading, why should those considerations trump 
this elegant, simple grading rule that treats everyone impartially. I think if you're like me, you'd be tempted to simply respond, look, I just told you what the problem was. The job requires that I recognize and reward hard work and learning. That's what grades are for. Is that a sufficient answer? Interestingly, this was roughly Aristotle's answer to a very similar problem of distribution. When we think about justice, Aristotle says, what we really need to think about is the essential nature of the activity in question and the qualities that are worth honoring and admiring and recognizing. One of the reasons that the best flute players should get the best flutes is that musical performance is not only to make the rest of us happy, but to honor and recognize the excellence of the best musicians. Justice for Aristotle is about getting what you deserve. And in the grading case, surely you deserve the grade you earn. And you earn a good grade by working hard, honing existing talents, developing new skills as you grapple with different material. My responsibility as your professor is to help you in that process. And a part of that is honoring academic excellence that I find among my students. That's what grades are for. More pointedly, it's hard to think of a good reason why grades should be for anything else. If grades honor academic excellence, then why on earth would I distribute them randomly or uniformly? It makes no sense. So that's a start. For at least one thing that many of us care about, the distribution of grades, we have a plausible, in this case Aristotelian, story about justice. I wonder if that story works for other things we care about.